auditorium and uh, uh, listen closely because he's going to put it in such ways and such examples you're not going to miss the point at all. The speaker today saying, talking about our glory and our joy is Mr. Curtis Whiteley. Good afternoon. It's wonderful to see everyone is, as it always is, on a another beautiful Sabbath day. Uh, as was mentioned by Ron, uh, our glory and joy is the title of this message today. And I'm continuing on uh, in this series that I began on 1 Thessalonians. And today we're going to try to cover four verses, so I'm getting real ambitious. Uh, it's not unlike me to sometimes go at a very sales pace, but today we're going to finish up chapter 2. Uh, previous messages, we, we talked about uh, different things, the, the topics that come to us uh, through what Paul's telling the Thessalonians, but in the first part of, uh, or the most of part of chapter 2, we see that Paul talks about his conduct towards the Thessalonians, uh, his experiences there, uh, the things that he went through that demonstrated that he was genuine in bringing the gospel message to the Thessalonian people. And then last message we covered the conduct that the Thessalonians, how they modeled their behavior after the churches in Judea, how they became imitators, how even despite having to have, you know, experience persecution from their own people, they were faithful. And in verse 17, we're going to pick it up because today we're going to go through verses 17 through 20. And actually, I want to start off by reading these four verses, but I also want to read the first five verses of chapter 3, because I think that it, it is a part of this same thought that he ends with oh, uh, here at the end of uh, chapter 2. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17 says, But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Therefore, he wanted to come to you. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again. But Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. Chapter 3. The first five verses says, Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone, and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith that no one should be shaken by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. For in fact, we told you before when we were with you, that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened, and you know. For, the, for this reason, when I can no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you, and our labor might be in vain. And so we're going to go through, not those last five verses today, uh, but we're going to go through the, first, the last four verses of chapter 2. Uh, and just to review, if you haven't been here, and just to give us some context, just to put it fresh in our minds, 1 Thessalonians is a book that's written by Paul where he went to this place called Thessalonica. He established a congregation there and abruptly they left. We don't know exactly why they left or what made them leave. We're going to get into that a little bit today. But Timothy was among Paul as, as well as Silas when they established the church. And now they're in Athens back south. And, 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 and Timothy is going to be sent to Thessalonica to see how they're doing, how they're faring in the absence of Paul, Timothy, and Silas. And so Paul is writing back to the Thessalonian church as he hears the good report. And in verse 17, Paul and his companions, he tells us they, they were separated not in heart, but physically, and this separation made them even desire more to come see them in the flesh face to face. And our touched upon some of chapter 3 today. And, and this desire that Paul had to see these individuals that 
he was emotionally attached to, that he had become family with. We see that in this passage, it's not in this translation, the New King James Version says, having been taken away from you for a short time and presence. But this phrase, taken away from you, is actually translated a little bit different. For example, the ESV translates it as torn away from you, indicating that it wasn't by choice. And it actually, what's behind this phrase is the Greek word aphor, apor, thanizo, which means to make an orphan. And you can see that that Greek word, which I'm butchering probably in pronunciation, it has a relation to that idea of orphan that we have in our own English language. Some translations actually, like if you were to read the NIV, translates this phrase, we were orphaned by being separated from you. Now what's interesting about this is that this is the only time in the New Testament or even the, what's called the LXX or the Greek Septuagint. The Septuagint is the, old, is the Greek Old Testament. So in, in these days, there was an Old Testament that was translated all into Greek because most of the people, they were, that was their uh, language of the day. That was their vernacular. The use of this word does kind of come off strange because usually when you refer to someone as being an orphan, what do you say? You're, you're, you're talking about children. You're not talking about parents. And Paul, in this letter, like for example in verse 7, he calls himself a nursing mother. And them, like a nursing mother, is one of the ways that, they, you know, that Paul describes him and Timothy and Silas towards the Thessalonians. Verse 11, he talks about them being like a caring father to the Thessalonians. And so, in most of the literature of the day, during this time period, they use the word orphan in a similar way that we use it today in our own context. A child who has, in some way, lost their parents. They're, they're parentless. But there has been examples, not many, where sometimes a parent is described as being orphaned by losing children. And by the very use of this word, as I mentioned, as comes out in some of the other translations, Paul is describing a separation that was not by choice. It was involuntary. And not only that, what's interesting is that John Byron, who's the author of the commentary on First and Second Thessalonians in the series The Story of God, Bible commentary, he notes that this phrase is in the passive voice. Now, that might not mean a lot to us a lot of times, but in, in this situation, it indicates that Paul and his traveling companions were forced to leave Thessalonica much, much sooner than they would have liked to. And we don't know exactly what the reason and what the circumstances. We just have Acts the 17th chapter. We see a little bit of it, uh, but we don't know all of the circumstances. As we're going to get into this, as the scriptures tell us, that not only were they taken from Thessalonica, but they were also prevented from going there. Not only that, but by using this word, we get a glimpse of the deep emotional anguish that Paul and his companions experienced by their separation. Because he's using this parental language, and he's describing himself and Timothy and Silas and what they felt emotionally by this separation in parental terms. When we read the previous verses in the early part of chapter 2, one of the things that we see is, is we seem that it's apparent that there are some people, probably not in the congregation, but there's individuals in Thessalonica, maybe they were against, obviously, the, the idea of the Christian message. We know that Paul had opposition in Thessalonica by the Jews. We know that when Paul says that you receive persecution from your own countrymen, that even Greeks or Gentiles were persecuting the Thessalonians. And so what we see is that it's possible that Paul is trying to explain the true, genuine emotions that he felt for the Thessalonians as another piece of evidence of their genuineness. Their genuine... We, we saw earlier that Paul talked about how they had authentic parental conduct toward, toward the Thessalonians. But Paul here is describing not only do they have parental conduct in the way they treated them, but they also have parental emotions. This expression, 
of emotion shows the genuine nature of Paul and his companions. As we see not only the parental concepts of, of conduct toward the Thessalonians that were displayed to them by Paul, Silas, and Timothy, but they're also experiencing the same emotional concerns. And so it makes me think about, you know, this time of year as I was reading this, and I'm a parent myself, and many of you are parents, and you know what it's like to worry about your children. You know what it's like to maybe sometimes have to be separated from them. Maybe we don't know what it's like to be separated by them by force. I haven't experienced that. I've experienced one time in my life where I lost my daughter Addie for what seemed like an hour but was like a minute and a half at a Tulsa Drillers baseball game. And it happened really quick. And I can tell you this, and there's no joking around. I mean, literally, my body, I mean, the heart racing, the, the, all the things that flood your mind in that minute and a half, the adrenaline, it's, it's almost like you're surreal. You almost become desperate feeling. Like it's almost hard to breathe because we live in this world and you think about the things, the awful things that happened. And luckily, she had just kind of wandered off and wasn't paying attention as we were going one way. And I was right by a person who worked there that had a walkie-talkie and they have different staff members and they can just, hey, this is what, she's wearing a pink jacket. And about two minutes later, we found her. But it was anguish. In this month of August... Maybe you've experienced this if you have young children, but every year, uh, it's, you know, it's back to school time, right? And as exciting as the time of year it is for many kids and parents, we often see the expressions of some great emotions, both by children, but as well as by parents. Because as we know, little kids, they get taken to school, preschool, first time ever being in a classroom, and mom or dad's going to leave and they start crying but we also see mom and dad sometimes walking out of the school building with tears in their eyes or you walk through a parking lot of a preschool back to school time and you see parents just sitting in there crying with blowing their nose. It's very common. I don't work in elementary, so I don't have to deal with that. But it gives you a glimpse of just how we are as parents when we have to be separated from our kids. And on the other end of the spectrum, they graduate from high school and they leave the home. So you take them to school, not preschool, where they're going to come home in six hours or eight hours, but you're driving them hours away sometimes to a university or college. Maybe it's the military. You're dropping them off. You're getting them settled in, and you make their ride home again without them to go live at that home without them, and they're going to be, in your, they're going to be absent from the home that they've lived in their entire life that you've raised them. And all of those emotions that come through your mind, whether it be when you're dropping off your kid off at free school or when you're dropping them off at college, those emotions that go through parents' minds are, what if they get into trouble? What if they need me? What if they don't know what to do? I've had parents worry about, and they, they go through a school building. As a high school principal and teacher before that, I, I, I'm, I'm a principal over freshmen and sophomores. And even at that age, parents are concerned that their children won't know where the bathroom is, <laughs> won't know where the lunchroom is. And I don't look at it as irrational. I look at it as natural. They're, they're parents. They're fearful. They have anxieties that go through them of what's going to happen with them. They're going to a new building. They've never been to the high school before. They're the youngest of all the different grade levels. So there's these emotions that flood them. And I think that this is exactly what Paul is describing. What they felt as they were ripped away from the Thessalonians. The emotions that they felt. And in these days, there was no telephone. There was no Gmail or, you know, there was no... Uh, Hotmail, there was no social media to stay connected. There was no Zoom meetings, if you know what I mean. Might have been a really good thing that there wasn't, because I'm about Zoomed out personally in the last year and a half. Physical separation, physical distance meant complete separation. If you left somewhere and had to go somewhere else, you knew nothing about them unless someone brought news from them or you went there yourself. And that's exactly what they did with Timothy. Timothy. 
they sent Timothy to bring back the report, which to Paul's excitement was good news. And we read Paul's anxiety in chapter 3, what we read at the beginning. Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and encourage you in concerning your faith. Because Paul had real anxieties over these individuals that they had to leave. In verse 18, Paul describes some of the issues that they ran into in not being able to get back to the Thessalonians. Paul describes that before Timothy was sent to see how they were doing, Paul wanted to ensure to the Thessalonians that he had attempted to go to them time and time and time again, but there was a supernatural force at play that prevented them from doing so. And we know that Paul tells us that this supernatural force was Satan. In some way, Satan blocked their path. Now, we don't know exactly what it is he did. There's some theories, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. But the interesting thing is that in the Greek... This phrase, but Satan thwarted us, is the Greek word enkopto, and it means to cut into. And Jeffrey Wema, who is the author of the Zonervan Illustrated Bible Background Commentary, noted that this term was often referred to in military practice of cutting up a road as to make it impossible or impassable for a pursuing army. So he's describing Satan cutting into their path preventing them, making their path impassable. And of course, he's probably being metaphorical. He's throwing things in front of them to keeping them from going. And so we see a military strategy being used by Satan or a military strategy being used by Paul to describe how Satan was operating, which should not surprise us as Paul, from personal experience, tells us that Satan opposes God, everything of God, that he attempts to prevent the the gospel's progress. He doesn't want the gospel to progress. And that he tempts Christ's followers. And as we see, he tempted Christ himself, who is much more powerful than we are, obviously. That much more is he going to tempt us. And this is also why later, and we've all read this before in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, right before he talks about the, the spiritual uh, armor that the Christian is supposed to put on in verse 10 of Ephesians 6. He says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And even though we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, we do wrestle against Forces, forces that try to prevent us, that try to block our path towards what God wants for us. And this specific example that Paul mentions about Satan thwarting their path, we are not completely sure what it was that Satan did because Paul simply does not tell us that information. But this hasn't kept some historians, Bible scholars, from trying to maybe think and and piece together some possibilities of exactly what Paul was talking about. And as John Byron outlines a few of these theories, one of them was, is the theory that that Christian house, or as what's known as the house of Jason, back in Acts, the 17th chapter, if you just want to turn there, there was a guy by the name of Jason. He seems to be the person who was the head of some house where maybe believers were living and being at. And it's possible that maybe Jason... This is according to one of the theories. Jason had guaranteed in order to get Paul and them released to be able to to get them out of the authorities' hands, which we're just going to read, maybe he made a promise to the authorities that that they would not return. But verse 5 of Acts the 17th chapter says this. But the Jews who were not persuaded became envious. This is talking about when they were in Thessalonica. Okay? This is when they were in Thessalonica, and this is what basically led them to have to leave the city. But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathered a mob, set all the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. 
Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees, the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason, that last verse, verse 9, when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. And some interpret this phrase, this when they had taken security from Jason, as when Jason had paid essentially the bell for them to be released. And so the theory is, is that a part of that bell was, was you know, security, not just monetarily, but possibly some sort of promise that they would not let them return. Other suggestions that this idea that Paul has about what Satan did to prevent them from, from coming back to Thessalonica, Thessalonia was related to that Jewish opposition that the apostles experienced in their mission at Thessalonia. The rioting that we saw. The Jews who were against Paul just like we read here in Acts 17 chapter verse 5. And that Paul is somehow interpreting this as under the influence of Satan. So we do not completely know. Perhaps maybe Paul thought that his presence there would just bring trouble to this beloved congregation. And so, instead of going himself, uh, he decided to send Timothy, who was able to go somehow, maybe because Timothy at this point wasn't as polarizing of a figure as Paul was. But this is what Paul describes to us. And he wants the Thessalonians to know that I, it wasn't that I didn't want to come. It was because of these things that prevented me from doing so. In the last two verses, in verses 19 through 20, Paul shifts his focus from explaining what prevented them from returning to the Thessalonians to why he longed so deeply to see this congregation. And he shows this reason by asking a question in verse 19 that he will emphatically answer in verse 20. Verse 19 says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, at his coming? For you are our glory and our joy. You are our glory and our joy. Now this word crown, that's right here, crown of rejoicing, is the Greek word stephanos. Stephanos, now does it, in this particular passage, doesn't refer to a crown that would be given to someone who is in royalty. Like, for example, a king passing down his crown uh, to his sons via some sort of royal bloodline. But what it was referring to is what is known as a laurel wreath that the winner of a Greek athletic competition would receive after winning some sort of athletic event, such as a race. These crowns or wreaths that were given to the victor were made from all different types of uh, plant life. And maybe you've seen like pictures or images of the old Olympics and even some of the modern Olympics, I think that they kind of give them some of the same things. I don't know if they do now. That's really bad. The Olympics just happened. I can't, I, I, I didn't pay a lot of attention to the Olympics this year, but you'll see a lot of times like the victor of different events, sometimes they'll have that wreath around their, their neck uh, along with, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the medal that they're given. Okay. Uh, especially when you look at images that are, you know, trying to be portrayed like from, you know, the ancient days of Greece and things like that. But usually they would be made by, you know, from some sort of palm branches or different flowers. But one thing is for sure. These crowns that were given, of course, as we know, they were perishable. And Paul would use this term not to completely describe it in the same way. He's using... The, the language that the Thessalonians would understand, you would be getting this laurel wreath that you would be given because you're a victor. But the laurel wreath that he's describing, the crown that he's describing was imperishable. And we see that, we see that in 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, verse 24. Let's go there real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. says, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it, and everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, 
but we for an imperishable crown. And so Paul's talking about this crown, this crown of rejoicing. As we're going to see, it really means crown of boasting. And he's given this as an example of the true crown that the Christian is really after. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4, we even read the same thing or a similar thing. Verse 4 says, and when the chief shepherd appears. It's interesting because when you read this in Peter, when you read Paul talk about this crown, he's always talking about it at the end, at the return of Christ. And so, and when the chief shepherd appears, verse 4, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. And as I mentioned in the New King James Version that we're reading, it says the crown of rejoicing, but it's actually in the Greek crown of boasting or crown to boast even though like I said we mention or the words translated rejoicing in the King James Version now Moot's comments on this word that we see translated rejoicing but other translations translated as boasting he comments on this word by saying Paul uses boasting or exultation to describe the Christian's delight and being commended for faithful service by the Lord at his return and so we read this, and we're going to get into this, we read this idea of boasting typically in negative terms within Christian circles. Because we're not supposed to be people who boast and are haughty and are prideful. But Paul uses this idea of boasting in the way that it should be used, which takes oneself out of as the object of boasting. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. It says this in verse 12, For our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God and more abundantly toward you. For we are not writing any other things to you than that you read or understand. Now I trust you will understand even to the end Verse 14, as also you have understood us in part, that we are your boast, as you also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. That you are in the day of the Lord Jesus. And just one more quick scripture. Philippians, the second chapter, verse 16 says, Holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain holding fast the Lord of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. In the day of Christ. And so it's this future hope that Paul's pointing to. This future hope of remaining faithful that Paul's pointing to. Just a quick quote from John Byron. He says, by answering his own question, Paul reveals that the Thessalonians will be the source of his hope and joy, a crown of boasting on the day that they all stand in the presence of Jesus together. And of course, I think this applies to all of those that Paul establishes in the faith, all of the churches. He holds all of them dear. Now, I think it's worth noting, before we get confused, or before you know, we read other scriptures of Paul, that Paul is clear about what the utmost of his boasting is in. In Galatians, the 6th chapter, verse 14, Paul says that it is Christ crucified that is at the heart of his boast. He says, but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. I think that what Paul is saying here is that he is not the object of his boasting. When we think of boasting, as I just mentioned, we think of that idea, those negative connotations that a lot of times the Bible warns us about. Those ideas of pride. People boast about and have pride about all different things in this life that are all temporal. How much money they have, how much talent they have, how much power they have. And in Jesus' day, in Paul's day, we would see often, like in the Gospels, they would boast about how righteous they were, how religious they were, or what race they were from, or what tribe or bloodline that they came from. But for Paul, 
His crown is not about, about accomplishing some sort of physical feat. It's not about the amount of knowledge that he has. And we know Paul was a very knowledgeable and a very educated individual. And he held none of that in comparison to what he had in Christ. None of that compared to what he had as a servant with the ability to be crucified in Christ and a new creature. It's also not about the amount of churches he established. You know, and, and sometimes I think that, you know, we kind of, and I don't say we, but, you know, you look at the Christian religion, uh, and I think that a lot of them are genuine who believe this way. You know, they don't have an understanding. Uh, some, I, well, they do have an understanding, but sometimes I think their understanding is almost makes them come off as gods in this war with, with, with Satan. Like somehow they're like in competitors with each other. And I think you know what I mean. There really is no competition between God and Satan. And so what I'm getting at is it's, it's this you know, race to save everyone you can. And that's what we should do. We should be preaching the gospel, planting the seeds, praying for the harvest. But sometimes I think people get they mixed up in the numbers game, right? How many people are they going to bring in? You know, it's all about bringing in people, the more and more and more and more and more people. And they neglect you know, the discipleship aspects, the, the aspects of really, truly teaching, you know, the authentic, you know, difficulties. Let's just put it how it is, difficulties that this life brings. It's the only way to life. We know that. That's the truth. But another truth is it is difficult. Being a Christian is not easy. Overcoming just your sinful nature is not easy because it's, it's, it's a journey, as we heard in the first message. Bad things befall us. Bad things happen to us. And it's a part of the growing process. It's a part of that becoming a new creature. It's not just happening all overnight. And I don't think Paul was wrapped up in numbers like you may see in some Christian churches today, which there's, I don't want to criticize them, but I, I, I just want to point out that I don't think that that is the way that God intended it. Of course, he wants the, the, the church to grow, and we see it grew, grew and, and rose, but it wasn't just about how many people can we get into this faith and boast about numbers. Paul was interested in running the race to the finish line as a faithful servant of God. He wasn't worried about how he started out. He wasn't worried about all that stuff that he learned, which was helpful. You know, as a Pharisee, he became very educated, and God chose him. And God probably had been planning from the very beginning that he was going to choose this individual and probably influenced his life and influenced the experiences that he had, which would make him a good candidate for the task that God had planned for him. I think that Paul was looking at it more along the lines of God has given me a stewardship. And my boasting, my, my pride is not in myself. But in taking that task and completely devoting my life to it. And at the very end, when I'm in the presence of Christ, I can say I was able to be effective to pointing people to you with the task that you gave me through the gifts that you gave me. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 through 8. Interesting, later on, he's writing a letter to Timothy now, right? So Timothy's now receiving a letter to Paul, or from Paul, and he says, As I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race. And of course, I think Paul knew that his days were very numbered. He wasn't saying, hey, I'm still alive, and I only had to do 40 years. I had to put 40 years in, Okay? All right, he, he's not looking at it like some people look at it. You know, we, we, we think about our jobs, right? His job, his occupation was being a missionary for God, being an apostle of God. He didn't sign up for this. God chose him. And when God chose him, God didn't say, hey, here's a 401K. In 40 years, you can be done. 
He knew his days were numbered. He knew what was going to befall him. And he said in verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. And so with this, I just have a couple reflections that I want us to kind of quickly go through. There was many different things I could have brought out in this, but I kind of went with some things that I think really struck me that I think is really relevant, not just to the passage, but to the day and age that we live in. The first reflection is more of a question. Are your anxieties over heavenly things? Are, do you have anxieties that are over heavenly things, or are your anxieties more focused on the physical things? I'll get to what I mean by this in a minute. When we read Paul, it's interesting because we see a humanness of Paul here in this letter, especially these verses we read. It's very clear when we read these first few verses, or these last few verses in chapter 2 and the very first verses in chapter 5, we see an anxiety that Paul has, a worry, an anxiousness like a parent has for their children. Paul describes anxiety over the unknown status of the Thessalonian congregation. And I don't want to, I want to be clear, this isn't to criticize Paul in any way, shape, or form. I think that this is actually something that is beneficial to us as Christians because we see the humanness of Paul. And, and even though he was this apostle of Christ and, and, and God had set, this, set him on this uh, magnificent uh, mission that would completely change The world, it would turn the world upside down and and his influence would be felt throughout all generations. He was human. He had fears, he had worries, he had stresses. And in fact, later on, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says this, besides the other things, verse 28 of 2 Corinthians chapter 11, besides the other things, because he's describing all the trials that he's went through in this letter, in this section of the scriptures, Beside all the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. And this word, concern, is the Greek word merimna, and means anxious interest. Paul's anxieties were not an evidence of his lack of faith, but rather a demonstration of a heart that was set on God's work. And he was serious about the charge that God had given him. Now, I don't want you to think that by asking this question, are your anxieties over heavenly things? Me saying, hey, you should have worries. Christians have worries. We know there's many scriptures, and we're even going to read some of these, uh, that tell us, you know, you know, stop worrying. Stop worrying. Cast your cares upon God. His, his anxiety is not a, a, a demonstration of a lack of faith. And, and when we have anxieties, I don't think it's always a demonstration of a lack of faith. But I think there's something to be said about just being truthful, that we are human beings with human nature, and we worry about things sometimes. And until the end, until we're out of this flesh and blood, we're still going to have some anxieties, some worries. But I think we need to do something. I think sometimes it's good to step back as a Christian and do an anxiety inventory. And what I mean by that is an anxiety inventory in our lives and look to see what we're fretting about. What we're fretting about. Is what we think about, is what we worry about, is what we fret over, or the deep concerns we have, are they over worldly temporal things or are they related to the heavenly things of God? Are they related to the heavenly things of God. Let's go to Matthew, the fifth chapter. There's two things that Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount in the fifth chapter that I think is related to this idea that I'm bringing out. Jesus says this in verse 19 of chapter 5. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there also will your heart be. 
So here we see that Jesus shows us that what we treasure reflects the heart. And even though that Paul had these anxieties, he had these worries, they were godly worries. He was concerned about the things of God. He was concerned about God's children. Just like the great example was Jesus at the very end. He's getting ready to be put to death. He's praying for his disciples. He has a concern for them. He knows what's going to happen to himself. And, and I'm sure that you know, in, in, human, in the humanness, in, in the human nature that he had, there was anxieties about that. But Jesus was more concerned about those who followed him. Just a little, script, few scriptures down in verse 31, we see Jesus. After he talks about this idea of worrying about the worldly things, eating, what you're going to drink, what you're going to put on, basically the, 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 the things you need to live in the life, right? You need food, you need water, you need clothing, shelter. And he says in verse 31, Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And here I think that Jesus, he, he brings out the, the, the basic worries of humans. It's not really much different today. Yeah, of course, there's different things that we have in our culture that they did, but we're still human beings. We still need food. We still need water. We still need shelter. We still need clothes. And I think that Jesus is showing them that their concerns are misplaced. He says, quit worrying about these things. Worry about the righteousness of God. And he's not saying worry. He's saying focus. Put your heart on that. Put your eyes on that. Make that be the first thing that you seek when you wake up. Not what you're going to eat. Not the money you're going to make. But the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And everything will, everything will take place as it should. And it's interesting because I went back to talk about that idea of doing an anxiety inventory. And looking at all the different things that we worry about. And if you were to write that on a piece of paper, where would that compare are these worries about spiritual things? I'll give you an example, and some of these are kind of personal. Uh, to an extent, I guess you'd say. I mean, I would, I would admit that I think that I've had problems before. Maybe you can relate to this. And so this isn't pointing out anyone else but myself in different times of my life. Do we worry more about our financial status, our jobs, our house, more than we do our spiritual status, the gifts that God has given us, and utilizing them, and the home of God's kingdom that is coming? So do I think about those things more than I think about those other things? Another example. Do we worry more about how well our favorite sports team is doing more than we are concerned that we rarely pray? Now that might be kind of humorous to some people, but I've actually thought that before. I've thought, man, I've gotten so angry at a silly game because the team that I like didn't win or weren't doing well. But when you're by yourself and maybe you're driving in the car and you're reflecting on these things and maybe, maybe it's Passover time and you're trying to examine yourself and you look back and you say, man, that's really nuts because I've gotten way more mad of the Oklahoma Sooners losing than I ever had of myself that maybe I went through a month where I didn't pray very much. So my anxieties were misplaced. I get more upset about things that are completely temporal that don't matter that I do things that really do matter and that really are important and that really do add substance and value to my life and growth. Do we fret more? And I think this is, maybe you've been here, maybe you haven't. I think that this is maybe something that uh, I guess I would say I'd, I've been guilty of before. Do we fret more over a negative comment someone says about a political viewpoint that we have on social media than we do at the unrighteous anger that we displayed at someone at work, our spouse, a friend, or maybe even one of our kids. So what I'm trying to do here is just get us to think about, when we think about what upsets us in life, how does that compare to whenever maybe we spiritually fall, like spiritually fall behind, or spiritual shortcomings? 
do we have the same sense of urgency to correct those things, to repent, than we do maybe the urgency we had to respond to someone who disagrees with our political point on Facebook. Or that we do with the worries that we have in temporal things, whether it be money, status, things like that. These are just some examples I thought about. And maybe we can identify with some of them and possibly other ways that we have allowed the cares of this world to outweigh the cares that we have on spiritual things that, this, that God has told us to keep our mind on. And that is the, the fo- focus and seeking of the, the righteousness of God and his kingdom. Let's go on to my next reflection and just leave you with that first reflection about asking ourselves, you know, the first point of reflection is, do, do we have a bunch of anxieties in our life that are, you know, temporal? Or are the main things we worry about, are they heavenly worries? And I wanted to be clear, this isn't promoting the idea that you should be worrying about a bunch of spiritual things. That's not what I'm saying. But we are left with this scripture I want to leave us with in this section. First Peter chapter 5, verse 6 and 7 says, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that, may, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares about you. So my second reflection is evil forces are real and will always be present in this life. You know, Paul wasn't saying, I think that it was Satan that was keeping us from coming to you. Paul had a discernment that there was a satanic force that was keeping them from coming to the Thessalonians. That there was some role that Satan was playing in this process. And I think that when we think about this idea of spiritual forces, like demonic forces and Satan, I think in some circles there is a tendency to blame every negative thing that happens in life or the world on Satan. And we can kind of go through that and say, well, maybe it wasn't directly Satan. Maybe Satan just in the very beginning, he influenced a situation to begin this way. And then, of course, he's the root cause of things. People can argue that. This is, my opinion, possibly overlooks the fact that we are very sinful creatures. We have a human nature. And that although Satan is the great accuser, we sometimes in our own human nature take care of it for him. He doesn't really have to intervene at all. On the other hand, people who I'd call a reductionist, as you've called, heard of them before, they want to reduce the Bible to you know, be certain, you know, they, they take out some of the supernatural elements and they think that the idea of Satan is just really not something that's real. They completely deny the idea of a role that an that a evil being has in this world, in this existence that there really is a satanic force that attempts to thwart God's plan. There's two ends of the spectrum here. As we read the scriptures, though, we know that there really is a real adversary looking to capitalize on our already very sinful nature and prevent us in growing in Christ. But we haven't been left powerless. We haven't been left powerless, have we? James, the first chapter, verse 27, tells us, Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, that's easier said than done. Because Satan's a million times more powerful than we are. He's a million times more intelligent than we are. We can't fight Satan alone. I'm not going to claim I know the limitations of Satan, what he can and can't do, but I know that as an angelic being... He understands reality differently than I do because he sees that spirit world. But even though he has this power in Christ, we have a key of defeating him. We've been given the armor of God. We've been given the sword of God. We see an example of Jesus being tempted by Satan, don't we? He's tempted by Satan. We see that Jesus does exactly what James tells us to do. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And also, he uses that sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It's interesting, and just wanted to, I had this quote I had wanted to read us as I was preparing this message. And you think about the idea of Satan attempting to do certain things, attempting to frustrate 
God's plans. And so that does happen. But I think we've even seen in history, like the Bible, for example, let's just keep it here in Thessalonians, where Satan does that, but God's sovereignty, God's powerfulness, God's ability is to take Satan's plans and to still bring out positive, something positive in the end. This quote from N.T. Wright in his book, Paul for Everyone, over the epistle of Thessalonians, both of them, both epistles. He, this is a quote from him. He says, but of course, if Paul had always been with his churches, we would never have had his letters. He's, he's kind of bringing out, if you think about it, what if Paul would have not been thwarted by Satan? He wouldn't have to write to him. He wouldn't have to write to anybody. Part of the providence of God, part of his all-powerfulness and all is the wisdom that he has is that he allows Satan to do these things. But good came from it. We have the letter of 1 Thessalonians today because of this. So because of that, God worked it out in his plan somehow that it would be a part of Scripture. And he uses Satan, his plans, to bring out something positive. It says his letters are a substitute for his personal presence, binding him and the churches together in a fellowship which, though not face-to-face as they would have liked, is nevertheless a fellowship of heart and mind. And I think that we today, even though we don't, we've never met Paul personally, we've never met Jesus personally, we, well, we have, we have met Jesus personally, but not in the flesh like Peter did and Mark did and things like that. But we have a fellowship in heart with them. We read their stories. I'm sure it's going to be surprising to Paul someday, or Moses even, or David and all these people in the kingdom of God when all these people are lined up wanting to ask them all these questions because of things that we learn from their experiences. I'll finish up this quote. Underneath the opposition of the Satan, we may sometimes discern the strange providence of God. This does not rob the satanic opposition of, or danger, uh, of danger or the threat, but reminds us that God remains sovereign even over present dark frustrations. And something else I just thought about when I thought about this was that even in the midst of what Paul went through and the Thessalonians went through, we see Paul and Silas and Timothy experience all types of persecution as they try to bring the gospel message to the Thessalonians. And what's interesting by that is you could probably argue Satan probably had a role in influencing those people to bring persecution to them. But also, on the flip side, the persecution they witnessed them go through made people look at Paul and them and say, man, this Jesus movement is for real. Look at these people. They're able to withstand these things and press on. Something they believe in is really authentic and genuine. They have this enthusiasm. They have this ability to, despite all of the trials that befall them because of this message that they're preaching to us, they continue they continue to do so. So I think that we have to realize that Satan, evil, there are evil forces in this world. We have been given power to fight against those. Not power on our own, but power through God, power through Christ. But we also need to understand that God's going to work everything out for his good, for his glory. Even taking Satan's plans and turning them into a positive. My last reflection before I close. Hebrews, the 12th chapter. Let's go there real quick. I just want to leave us with this. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verse 1 and 2. We read this. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded, surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. I'm wanting to read this because I'm looking at people here. My last reflection is simple. Finish the race. And right here, the author of Hebrews is talking about individuals that he had just listed. We call it the faith chapter, right? All these men and women of faith from history that we can look at, that have all finished the race, that have all died and didn't receive the promises, but were faithful to the end. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, 
Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And we have individuals that have went on before us here in the Bible. But we also have witnesses that have lived in our lives. We have family members. We have people that's been a part of this church that have left, that have become, in my opinion, a part of this great cloud of witness that remain faithful to the end and finished their race. Finished their race. So in closing, as this message is entitled, Our Glory and Joy, and we read what Paul says about his longing for these Thessalonians and the things that he went through and some of the points that we kind of went over. That last little part of chapter 2, he talks about this idea about them being the, his, you know, his crown, his joy, his glory. And I think that what is our crown or what is our glory or what is our joy according to this true, authentic Christian faith, I think is to be a faithful servant of God by utilizing the gifts that God has bestowed on us that God has made a steward of us over to his glory and at his coming being able because we are newer to the end we finish the race being able to demonstrate that faithfulness in the presence of our Savior that he gave us some talents and he says to us because we finished that race we were that faithful servant he says to us well good and done good faithful son okay